Good evening, everyone, and for that famous line, and now for something completely different. Not only do I not look like Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> um, and uh, I have quite a different topic to talk to. So I'm, I'm really honoured and delighted to be here. Thank you to the Academy, to Peter Piot, who, who nominated me. I'm here as a clinician, as a scientist, as one of the 17% of women now. In, in the academy, um, and also as an African. I was born in the bush in northern Uganda. I just collected the wrong color of skin. So I'm hoping we can uh, add a little bit more diversity as we go forward in, in many different ways. So what am I going to be looking at now? Well, I'm going to be looking at something that affects all of us. All of us were once a newborn. Many of you have given birth or been at the birth of, of a baby. And what difference can be made to that universal truth? We all entered the world naked, very vulnerable. And what happened then depended on who our mother was and where we were. But we don't enter equal. And in many ways, we think of these things around the world as huge, big problems that's all bad news. But just at the end of 2015, we ended the 25-year era of the Millennium Development Goals. What's been called by the UN Secretary General, by leaders in the World Bank, as one of the greatest successes in human development history, where child mortality and maternal deaths have been halved. So huge impact. And yet at the end of this time period, with a halving of maternal deaths, we still have 303,000 women who die giving birth every year. We still have 3.2 million children who die after the first month of life. And a lot of those, it's driven by stunting and even by life course in utero, uh, poor growth. And on the agenda, only because of those goals are newborn deaths, deaths in the first 28 days after birth, 2.7 million. They're not there because their mothers are on the street complaining about their babies dying. That happens in this country, but not for most of these babies. They're not even there because professionals are complaining about it. They're there because of a global target, where now almost half of child deaths around the world are in this time period. They're there because funders and governments committed to a target, and because data has helped to drive some of that visibility. But having a big number is not enough. Why do they die, where do they die, and what can be done about it? And still not on the agenda are 2.6 million stillbirths. These are babies dying in the last three months of pregnancy. And most shockingly, 1.3 million, where the woman goes into labor with a live kicking baby whose baby dies when she's in labor. That should be a scandal beyond scandal because it only happens where we're not paying proper attention to that woman and her care during labor. But they don't count. The Millennium Development Goal data starts on live births. They don't enter the numerator. They don't enter the denominator. There were no targets. So here we are at the end of this time where progress has been slower for newborn deaths, which have come onto the agenda in the last five to 10 years since the Lancet series in 2005. Richard Horton and The Lancet has contributed hugely to the visibility of things that were not being seen. And these almost nine deaths for women and children, nine million that are still happening, two-thirds are now concentrated around the time of birth. This uniquely affects women, but it requires all disciplines of science, not just people who do global health. The innovations that happen in immunology or in maternal immunization can make a huge difference to this. And this is what my work over the last 20 years has, has been focused on, starting as a clinician, looking at individual babies and women, particularly in Ghana, moving through thinking if we got the numbers we would do better, to thinking if we did large randomized trials around Africa that show what we can do for women who give birth at home, we would do better. But what I see now is it's not just about the numbers and solutions, it's also very much about the political accountability about those outcomes, because stillbirths still have no target and are still stillborn on the future uh, goals. So what can we learn from what has changed during this rapid progress, particularly for child deaths? 
So this is work we published in The Lancet uh, last year, looking at the different causes of child death over this time period. And the, what the graph shows, if I can work this laser pointer, is the average annual rate of change for each of the major causes of child death. And the top nine of the ten fastest reducing cause of child death are among infections. We like to think maybe simply that that's all due to immunizations, but it, it's not true. Uh, in fact, for example, HIV, which is a very complex social stigma, complex systems intervention for mother-to-child transmission, we've reduced by more than three quarters in this time period. So this is a critical point to note because now the global pie chart for causes of child death is entirely different to what probably most of you have in your mind. If I hadn't showed this pie chart and asked you what the main causes are, people say malaria, HIV. HIV is now less than 100,000 child deaths a year. And in fact, HIV, malaria, and measles together are less than direct complications of preterm birth. So this is for 2015. As we go forward in an academy thinking about science and thinking about still this huge number of global child deaths, yes, infections and innovations and how we deal with that will make a difference. But if we're living in a pie from the past, we won't be pushing forward on the things that are now around half of that, which are deaths in the newborn period. So now preterm birth is the leading cause of child deaths globally. And probably your image of a preterm baby is a you know, 23 weeker like the ones I used to ventilate here in, in the UK and what we do for them. But I want to show you that most of these deaths actually are in near term babies where we can really do something different to change what happens. But what about stillbirths? So even in the UK, when we published the Lancet Stillbirth Series this year, there was a whole paper on perceptions and, and how... Uh, what, what people think about the preventability of stillbirths. Part of the problem, I'm afraid, for the preventability of stillbirths is people don't know the causes. There are fallacies that maybe they're all meant to be, they're all congenital abnormalities. Um, it's made worse because, unfortunately, there are more than 40 classification systems. I think it's a rite of passage for UK male obstetricians and European male obstetricians to make up a new classification system. Um, <laughs> But what this analysis showed in, in Lancet earlier this year, and this is by region of the world, is that, for example, syphilis causes around 200,000, David Moby's there, <laughs> around 200,000 stillbirths a year. So by not counting stillbirths, we have missed the focus to drive change for doing something about syphilis. How it should be unacceptable that this is still something that is, is causing such a, a burden around the world. So what I, I want us to realize is that some of the things that we have uh, failed to measure and think about in stillbirths are actually extremely addressable. So with this background in science that has been in, in the Lancet uh, and with the pressure coming up towards the end of the Millennium Development Goals, realizing we hadn't made enough progress for newborns. Uh, the UN, uh, really pushed by countries, launched this Every Newborn Action Plan. More than 80 organizations, uh, thousands of, organ of individuals involved, and a World Health Assembly resolution. There's also a linked strategy for ending preventable maternal deaths. And then this year, we had the stillbirth series to really try and show that stillbirths need to be kept within this momentum. And I don't have time, obviously, to cover uh, the details that are within this, but I want to just leave you with some key points from the data about what we can do. So where do these deaths occur? Well, currently, one in every four births around the world are in Africa. With Ongoing uptake of family planning in a kind of medium scenario. By 2030, around a third of the world's births will be in Africa. But with the same trajectory for deaths, 60% of child deaths are going to be in Africa. And Africa's needs not just people to drop things from the sky on Africa, but for us to look at the science and the capacity and the leadership within Africa to be able to change that should be unacceptable. If we look at the countries with the highest neonatal mortality rates are in red, 
and the big blue dots are those with the biggest numbers of neonatal deaths. So India alone has around 800,000 neonatal deaths a year, an unenviable first position. The good news related to that is on the table on the left, the countries that are coloured in with UN blue, within one year of the Every Newborn Action Plan being launched, they've had national plans uh, uh, launched to address newborn deaths. So, for example, India, it was by the Prime Minister and Bella Melinda Gates, with significant funding and a huge scale-up of both community and facility care. The good news? The bad news is these are the countries where it's the most risky place in the world to be born. And Sierra Leone has the unenviable uh, uh, accolade here of being the riskiest place in the world to be a newborn. This was before Ebola, this data, so it's actually going to be worse. And I will put to you that what happens to a newborn baby in your health system is a very sensitive indicator of whether your health system works or not but that it took Ebola coming along to shout that loudly. And in the reconstruction and the effort that's going forward after Ebola, we need to think what happens for women and children and what can be done in that situation to change that, and in other countries with similar health systems that are struggling. What about countries that are making progress? So the redder the colour here, the slower the progress. So the bad news for... Me, as an African, is that Africa had the highest rates and also the slowest progress. But the good news is that in every single region, there are countries that are making rapid progress. Malawi, for example, has moved almost twice the speed of all their neighbours over the time period of the MDGs for reducing newborn deaths. The best way to get Uganda to speed up is to go to the high-level people in Uganda and say, what about Malawi? So these are useful pieces of data. When do they die and what to act on first? The riskiest day of your whole existence is the day that you are born. So skipping lightly through two years of agonising over pretty problematic data, we estimate that one million babies are born on their birthday, their only day. And it doesn't have to be like that. And linking that to these 1.3 million intrapartum stillbirths and also a real spike in risk for maternal deaths, the pessimist says that that time of birth is a terrible time of risk. The optimist says if you were to invest and change that time period, think of the gains that you're getting. You're getting a triple return on investment. The two most important days in your life, the day you're born, the day you find out why. And there are many research agendas within this on births around the world with scope for huge change and not enough people researching on it. That this return on investment, if we count the development outcomes, because this is also the time when your brain is most likely to be damaged, uh, are huge. And the first thing that we can do is to look at the quality of births that are now in facilities. So we now have three quarters of the world's births happening in hospitals. Over the last five years, we've had a huge push, partly because of uh, reducing some of the financial barriers, trying to increase uh, financial access in the poorest countries. The picture on the left is Ghana, where I used to work. You can even walk along the, the, the wards, the postnatal wards along the floor without you know, babies and mothers on mattresses, not enough space. On the right is in India, where there have been financial incentives to draw women into facilities. We may be doing more harm than good at the moment. In many of these places, we may be giving people hospital-acquired infections. We may be contributing to antimicrobial resistance. So this is something, if we aren't really doing something different on this in the next five years, we actually could be doing more harm than good. So learning from the historical data in the UK and the US, so in the 1900, both the UK and the US had neonatal mortality rates around 40. We're now down in the UK to between two and three. If we look around the world, there are countries that have these levels at the moment. The first thing to do is the public health approaches, tetanus immunisation, cleanliness, moving people into facilities. Then we need to deal with better birth care within the facility for the woman, for the baby, 
And then the last phase is what we do more for individualised care and neonatal intensive care. And at that phase, we must start looking beyond survival, not just having babies survive, but look at the quality of survival. So if we think about what we can actually do, so around the world, around 130 million births, whether they're born at home, 45 million at home, whether they're born in facilities, whether they're in the UK and Chelsea in a nice private place, or whether they're in rural Ethiopia, we need to be breastfeeding them. But if you look at this as a scientist, there are things that we have massive evidence base on, breastfeeding, hygiene, cord hygiene, that we fail to do, apparently simple things, and yet we don't do them. And yet, we have things where we need gadgets, where around the world we're moving very fast. So in the last five years, we've had a huge push on neonatal resuscitation. And I think it's good because people actually look at these babies that we weren't even looking at sometimes, they're looking more at the placenta. Um, and we have you know, low-cost uh, baby mannequins that we fill with water. Uh, we have uh, ambu bags that are much lower cost that have made a big difference. But funnily enough, donors would much rather fund this than, than some of the simple things like breastfeeding. What about kangaroo mother care? So this is an innovation that started in Colombia uh, for middle-income countries and yet has transited to the UK and Scandinavian units. Uh, is a, quite a, apparently low-tech solution and yet has a massive impact on reducing deaths. So this is something that could be scaled up. And then if we look at the neonatal intensive care that we think of in these countries becoming less intensive, we have opportunities in also translating that. And we mustn't forget that the poorest are still these 45 million births at home. What do we do with those? We have evidence from large cluster randomized trials of uh, interventions that we can take, but that are very difficult to scale up. And so to finish off, what do we need to do differently? The first thing is that the reason these aren't on the agenda is because the, vo the very people who are affected most, these women, don't really have a voice. We need to give these women a voice and be listening to them because this is a really traumatic event. So yes, we need to listen to women. Yes, we need to bring more innovation to bear and look at the investment. So for example, in about 200 million donor disbursements over the last decade, the word stillbirth is mentioned three times. It's not on people's donor lists. We need to measure better. But what I would say, especially to this audience in the academy, that the academy has a platform and a power to be able to be intentional about raising the capacity of uh, leadership. And I would flag particularly within Africa and particularly for women. And I really hope that this is something that would be taken forward uh, and would make a difference because this is a huge potential impact. And thank you to the many teams that I have worked with who've input to this and many funders and also to my husband with brain cancer, who is here and has been hugely supportive to me. Thank you. Thank you.